Hi, this is documentary filmmaker John Ziegler. I'm also the guy behind www.framingpaterno.com. Some of you may recognize the t-shirt that I'm wearing from the website. And this is essentially part two of a, a two-part video analysis of what Armin Katayan from CBS uh, Sports slash News has been doing uh, over the last two nights on the Jerry Sandusky slash Penn State uh, scandal. Yesterday I did an expose, an analysis, uh, I basically eviscerated uh, Armin Katayan's report on the CBS Evening News. You can find that on our website, framingpaterno.com, or if you search YouTube, you can find that as well. Tonight on Showtime was the premiere of CBS Sports' 60 Minutes. And on that particular show, Katayan did a much larger piece on the Jerry Sandusky scandal, interviewing extensively the two prosecutors in that case. And this was extraordinary on a number of levels, as was yesterday. Uh, the media malpractice that I documented in yesterday's video was probably doubled or tripled in this particular uh, piece because it was longer. And I would say the, the number one thing that uh, Katayan does in this particular piece is that he performs media malpractice by omission. Omission is one of the more nefarious forms of media bias, and Katayan purposely, I believe, although it's possible he's this incompetent and this ignorant of the facts that he didn't even realize what he was doing, but he leaves out a lot of very important information for people to fully understand uh, what it is that actually happened in this scandal. I'm going to only go through about four different parts of the video, because otherwise this video would probably break YouTube. Uh, I'm going to deal with Mike McQuarrie, Dottie Sandusky, uh, Curly, Spanier, and Schultz, and then Joe Paterno. Uh, first, we have Mike McQuarrie, the main witness in the case, and I want you to listen very carefully to what is clearly and obviously a premeditated, purposeful rehabilitation of Mike McQuarrie as a person and as a witness, and I want you to remember what they say here in comparison to what they later say about Joe Paterno and how obvious the double standards are when it comes to evaluating people's behavior. But here is the first part of the rehabilitation of Mike McQuarrie. Quarterback and captain of the team. On Friday night, February 9th, 2001, McQuarrie, then a 26-year-old graduate assistant coach, walked into a football locker room and into a scene that changed his life forever. Stunned to see Sandusky, a man he idolized, sexually molesting a young boy in the shower. McQuarrie reported the incident to head coach Joe Paterno the next morning, and later testified before a grand jury in at Sandusky's trial. All right, let's stop right there, because that's an amazing little statement there by Katan. He very casually mentions that McQuarrie witnessed this episode, and he later testified at a grand jury and at Sandusky's trial as if those incidents happened one after another. Katane never mentions the fact that, oh, by the way, there were 10 years, or almost 10 years, between the time when McQuarrie saw whatever it is that he saw, and he first testified in front of a grand jury. 10 years! And, oh, by the way, McQuarrie got the date, the month, and the year of the episode flat wrong which to me is by far the most underrated fact in this entire case, which becomes incredibly important as we listen to more of the rehabilitation of Mike McQuarrie. He's trying. To some of his critics, McQuarrie is a coward who didn't do nearly enough. But as a result of finally going public, McQuarrie became a scapegoat, losing his job, his house, and his career. He is now suing Penn State for $4 million in back pay and benefits. Prosecutors can't understand his treatment. There are those who would uh, retrospectively try and uh, assess how he, uh, in their view, should have behaved at the time or afterwards. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, let's talk about that for a second because I've heard it a hundred times. If I've heard it once, he should have stepped forward. He should have punched Sandusky's lights out. Um, why didn't he do more? Or he should have gone to the cops. To which you guys say what? I say, you got to put yourself in this guy's shoes. I mean, could he have done all those things? Yes. But in that time and space, in those handful of seconds he sees that, he is so shocked. His entire universe is just being shattered. 
to its core. And I don't think it's unbelievable, I don't think it's even strange that he would panic and run out the door and seek his father. And then he immediately reports it. He immediately reports to Paterna. I just don't think that any of that is warranted. In fact, I think it's just grossly unfair. All right, let's evaluate those statements because some of those are pretty extraordinary. So Frank Fina, the prosecutor in the case, says that Mike McQuarrie had his universe shattered to its core. Okay, I guess that's possible. My universe might have been shattered to my core if I saw a living legend uh, sexually assaulting or raping, as the media endlessly reported in November of 2011, a, a boy that I thought mistakenly was 10 years old at that time. However, um, <laughs> I don't think I would have forgotten the date, the month, or the year. I don't think I would have thought that it occurred after 9-11 when it actually occurred before 9-11. I don't think I would have played in two charity golf tournaments sponsored by the guy I saw sexually assaulting this young boy or joked around with him physically at a Easter Seals charity football game. I doubt I would have gone out of my way to ask him about a walk-on from Central Mountain High School, and I don't think I would have had a cordial relationship with him for 10 years uh, up until the time in which investigators came to me to ask me what I saw 10 years earlier when all of a sudden my relationship with Jerry Sandusky would have changed. This is what happened with Mike McQuarrie. It's also important to note that some of this is by Mike McQuarrie's own words. In his December 2011 testimony, he was asked, when was it that you started to tell other people in the program that Jerry Sandusky should not be around the locker? Was it before you were approached by investigators or after? Mike McQuarrie's own words were almost certainly after, which makes perfect sense with my interview with Jerry Sandusky from prison because Jerry didn't even know that Mike McQuarrie was the witness up until it became public in November of 2011. So he was able to see his relationship with Mike McQuarrie through a pretty much unbiased lens. So this is clearly and obviously an attempt by the prosecution to rehabilitate Mike McQuarrie because they know they're going to need him in the coming trial with Spanier, Curley, and Schultz. There's a good chance he's going to get destroyed because his story makes no sense on any level and it has changed many, many times. And speaking of omission, not one word in there about the fact that the alleged victim in the Mike McQuarrie episode, victim number two, has said on the record, as you can see at our website, framingpaterno.com, numerous times as a, an adult, a 24-year-old married sergeant in the Marine Corps, that Mike McQuarrie is not telling the truth, and that nothing sexual happened in the shower, and that investigators tried to get him to lie about his relationship with Jerry Sandusky, and even said this publicly in his own name in letters to the editor before the story became national. Yet none of this is mentioned in this piece, as if it never happened and is irrelevant, even though that very same person just got paid a lot of money by Penn State as a victim, alleged victim, but I don't believe that person is ever going to claim that there, he was assaulted in the shadow. So that's Mike McQuarrie. Now remember that for when we go to the section on Joe Paterno, but now I want to turn to a, an area of this piece that really got me upset, because it deals with Dottie Sandusky, who I've gotten to know pretty well over the last several months. I've probably spoken to Dottie Sandusky as much or more than almost anybody in this case. And I am positive of very little in this case. I'm not 100% positive, but very little in this case. But one of the things I'm positive of is that Dottie Sandusky, to this day, believes with all her heart that Jerry Sandusky is innocent. And I also know that Dottie Sandusky is going through a living hell, uh, as you might expect, based upon what she has had to deal with, the fact that she has lost so much. Uh, financially, she's in difficult times. She goes down to see Jerry Sandusky in prison, driving herself for four and a half hours each way, once a week, uh, to see him under deplorable circumstances. And to then claim that Dottie Sandusky is lying and that she actually believes him to be guilty, which I know for a fact is not true, really makes me question the nature of these prosecutors. But here is what they had to say uh, about Dottie Looking Sandusky. The prosecution had rested its case. The defense put Dottie Sandusky on the stand to defend her husband. But Gettigan was ready for his turn at the witness. They say you should never ask a person a question that you don't know the answer to. But sometimes you know there's no good answer. So I don't know what they're going to say, but I know there's no good answer. 
And uh, I asked Mrs. Sandusky, uh, you've heard, I said, you've heard the testimony what all these young, young men have said about what happens to them and their boys. Can you tell me one good reason why they lie? She had no answer. That was a moment. I, I thought it was one of the most poignant moments of the trial because you could literally hear time going by because she just sat there and, it, you know, tick, tick. And she looked over at Sandusky and they locked eyes and then she, her head dropped down and she said, I don't know. I mean, it was, I, I just thought it was unbelievably powerful. You thought it was unbelievably powerful, Frank Feenan. Okay. Did it ever occur to you that Dottie Sandusky was in an absolutely impossible situation? That she was being asked about boys that she thought of as her own sons, most of them, those who testified as victims in this case? Did it ever occur to you that she knew that the only explanation that was consistent with what she thought was the reality was that these boys were making vicious lies up about her husband for the purposes of money or, or whatever she couldn't even comprehend the motivation would be, and that if she did say that, she would be destroyed by you or Joe McGettigan sitting, sitting next to you, or and that by the media would absolutely torture her if she said anything bad about the victims? What was she supposed to say at that point? So to, to claim, I mean, you can say whatever you want about Jerry Sandusky being you know, whatever you think he is, but to try to claim that Dottie, because that's what they're doing here, that Dottie is lying, that she somehow knows Jerry is guilty, and that she is lying, and that she perjured herself, is about as outrageous as anything I've seen in this case so far, because I am positive that is a bald-faced lie. And as I said, it makes me question everything that these guys are saying. Now, speaking of everything they're saying, let's now go to... Graham Spanier, Tim Curley, and Gary Schultz, whose trial is still to come, and I believe it is these, it, these trials, this trial that's coming up, is the real motivation for what this entire 60 Minutes piece is about. It is why the Sandusky prosecutors have decided now to give these interviews, because they are trying to pollute the jury pool in this case, and they have done a heck of a job. Listen to this. Running trial and charges of perjury and conspiracy to cover up years of Sandusky's abuse. They have denied all wrongdoing. They absolutely premeditatively, I believe, uh, didn't report this and hit it. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any question, but that's what Spanier, Schultz, and Curley did. Covered it up. The evidence, you know, now they're going to be tried on that. I understand. And, uh, but I investigated that case. Uh, they deserve to be charged, and, and I hope justice will be served there. Now that is an amazing statement, a series of statements by Frank Fina. And I believe they, them to be unethical and potentially even illegal, depending on how you interpret the law. But they're also completely illogical. And here's what I will pay $1,000 to anybody who can get Frank Fina to answer uh, this particular question. Okay, Frank Fina, you say, later on we're going to get to this, that Joe Paterno was not part of a cover-up. Yet you say that Spanier, Curley, and Schultz were premeditatively part of a cover-up to conceal the crimes of Jerry Sandusky. Here's what I want to know, Frank, and this is what I'll pay the $1,000 to charity for if someone can get them to answer this. Please explain to me, Frank, how that conspiracy started. Because when you take Paterno out of that equation, the all-knowing, all-powerful God of State College, then only one of two things can happen. Either Graham Spanier had to come up with the idea, in which case, by the way, he's an abuse victim himself as a child. Graham Spanier goes or says to Curley and Schultz when they come to him with this problem, you know what, I think we need to cover this up. What would have happened, Frank, under that scenario? Under that scenario, the moment that Spanier got fired and Curley and Schultz got indicted, guess what would have happened, Frank? Curley and Schultz would have flipped on Spanier. That hasn't happened. So we can X that scenario off as not plausible. So then what would be the other scenario? Oh, I know. Curley and Schultz decide on their own, as employees of the president of Penn State, a very prestigious institution, a guy with a great reputation, they've decided on their own, you know what? We think that we ought to cover this up for this ex-employee that nobody likes. 
and Tim Curley and Gary Schultz decide, let's go to Grand Spanier, our boss, the president of the university, and let's propose this idea of a criminal cover-up. Well, first of all, that's asinine. Nobody in the, in the history of the world goes to their boss with the idea of, hey, let's cover something up uh, criminally for no motive whatsoever. But if that had happened, then Spanier and Curley and Schultz would have all flipped on each other by this point. And none of that has happened. And the reason that hasn't happened was because there was no cover-up. And what is happening here is nothing more than the pollution of the jury pool sponsored by CBS and Showtime. Now let's get to Joe Paterno, because this is extraordinary, because we now learn something new about what Frank Fina really said that CBS did not air on the evening news yesterday. As for the legendary Paterno, who was fired and died of lung cancer months later, Fina believes finger pointing over the icon's role or influence in an alleged cover up is misplaced. Do you believe that Coach Paterno was a part of the conspiracy to conceal, to cover up the crimes at Penn State by Jerry Sandusky? I do not. And, and I, I'm viewing this strictly on the evidence, not any kind of fealty to anybody. Uh, I did not find that evidence. I, I always viewed Paterno as just one piece of this case not the most important piece, not the center point of this. This isn't the Joe Paterno story. I mean, this is a story about Jerry Sandusky, Spanier, Schultz, and Curley. But you know as well as I do, Frank, Joe Paterno was the most powerful man on that campus, arguably the most powerful coach in college football. He knew what was going on in that university, and the argument is if he knew what he knew, he should have put a stop to it. He should have done more. Well, uh, that's right. And I, and I don't see any need to judge him beyond his own words. Um, and I'm not, I'm not defending him at all. I think, I think the realistic view of him is that, first of all, he was one of the few people that did anything. He did come forward. He did uh, report this to his supervisors, the head of the police department. Um, and ultimately, he said it best. I didn't do enough. I should have done more. Wow. Now that's really interesting because that whole business about, well, he's one of the few people who actually did do something. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He reported to his superiors and to the head of the police. That wasn't in the CBS Evening News report from the day before. The part of Armin Katayan arguing with him about, well, he was the most powerful guy in State College and he knew all and he was all powerful, so powerful that he got fired over a cell phone. Uh, even though he didn't do anything wrong, according to the prosecutor in the Sandusky case. So that's really extraordinary. So CBS chose to keep yesterday in their evening news the part where Armin Katayan is arguing with the prosecutor, giving his opinion about Joe Paterno having to have had knowledge and having to have been part of a cover-up, and they omit the part about Frank Vina saying, Oh, by the way, he was one of the only people who actually did do something. And then, of course, as I mentioned in yesterday's video, he completely and totally misquotes Joe Paterno's often misquoted statement, which was not, I didn't do enough. I should have done more. That's not what he said. He said, with the benefit of hindsight, I wish I had done more. More meaning more than what he did, which is what he was supposed to do. And also I want you to consider the treatment of Joe Paterno in that sequence. And by the way, I'm not even going to get to it, but then they end up using about uh, a minute of video of the statue being taken down here just to make sure you, you remember uh, that Joe Paterno's legacy was destroyed and this was the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of college sports, yada, yada, yada. Compare that treatment to the treatment of Mike McQueary. Because I don't know how in a rational world, if Mike McQueary is telling the truth, and that's the best case scenario for Mike McQuarrie. If he is now telling the truth in his current version of the story, then based upon that, how can you possibly argue that Mike McQuarrie handled this situation better than Joe Paterno? And yet they defend Mike McQuarrie. And in fact, Tina later on in this piece actually says, quote, I'm not defending Joe Paterno. <laughs> He's afraid to even say it. He's not afraid to defend Mike McQuarrie, but he's afraid to defend Joe Paterno. To me, this is 
Another classic example of massive, continual, media malpractice with regard to this case, and we will continue to document it at our website, www.framingpaterno.com.